All right, friends and neighbors, it's video time. And this time, we're taking one more step on that quas journey we started in the last couple of videos. So if you remember from previously, we talked about latency packet loss and jitter. We talked about application performance and some of the things that we're worried about. So generally speaking, our toolbox goes something like this. We're trying to reserve or conserve bandwidth whenever and wherever possible. We're trying to improve latency, control jitter or reduce jitter, uh, and see what we can do about packet loss, reducing those error prone links. And one of the examples that we had was voice over IP transmissions. But of course, what you're looking at are the performance metrics for whatever application you're targeting. So back to my favorite word. Remember that when you go to the doctor's office, what do they always do? Height and weight, right? Why do they do that? Because they're trying to get an idea of what's normal for you. That's your baseline. So they do it all the time. You should be doing the same exact thing with your network. You're trying to understand its base or baseline behavior. You're trying to look at what normal traffic is, what applications are out there on, on a normal everyday basis. You're trying to look at average or current usage, and that means applications, it means network traffic, but it also means number of users, throughput concerns, all of those. What happens on your busy hour? Telephone networks have a very, very well-known term called a busy hour. It is the time of day where you have spikes. In networks, we a lot of times see spikes in the morning when everybody's logging in, getting their stuff down. You see it at the end of the day sometimes when everybody's saving their work up to the network. So what is your busy hour? What is your busy hour for the applications that you're worried about? We want to make sure that when we're setting up our baseline tests, that we're doing tests to all possible locations. It's really nice if your application or whatever the process you're testing works well on the test bed. But of course, where the rubber hits the road is when your application is under network load and there are lots and lots of folks trying to use it and maybe they're using it remotely. So make sure that you test to all possible destinations and end to end, the farthest distance that you can dream up. You wanna test it under varying network conditions. So that means light load, heavy load, different times of day, all those kinds of things. And then of course, whatever else you can think of, test that thing. All right, so we've been leading up to how do we handle or how do we deal with quality of service? And what we're gonna base our discussion on is something called the Cisco QOS model. And the Cisco QOS model is based on something called RFC 2474 differentiated services. And of course it's an RFC, so that comes from the Internet Engineering Task Force. And the idea is that every packet that enters the network is in some way classified or labeled, and then you find some kind of treatment or you define a treatment for that packet or packets or flow. And we find these labels inside the IP header. Now these, these labels can also be carried from the layer two frame on up into the layer three IP header. And we'll see how that works in a little bit. If you're trying to prepare for, for understanding really all the things that we're about to talk about, make sure that you understand the IP header, that you understand a little bit about what happens on the wire when you capture traffic, and of course, VLANs and trunks, specifically 802.1Q, very helpful to have your arms wrapped around right now. Okay, so the basic process goes something like this. You've got a whole bunch of different kinds of packets out there. What you're trying to do is differentiate those packets from each other. Usually we do that based on flow or type of traffic. So the example that I've been using is voice over IP. Voice over IP has a very particular uh, look and feel on the, on the network, a very particular set of protocols, and a very particular set of requirements. Completely different than some of the other applications like email. So you process those packets, you're gonna assign a label, then you're, gonna, you're going to uh, create a treatment for any packet that has that label, and then you're gonna act on that. Now the other thing that you're gonna do is you have to understand that we have resource limits. Now we already talked about quas, you can't create something out of nothing. So within the, the bounds of your network capacity, you're gonna try and carve out some of the capacity for a particular flow or flows. And we're gonna have a policy that acts on the limits that we specify for that particular flow. Now, sometimes we even provide different levels of treatment in times of congestion or latency. Now, what that means is that sometimes things are activated given network conditions. 
if I have a particular set of packets and I'm saying I want these particular packets to be guaranteed a certain percentage of bandwidth, that's there all the time. But if I have queuing in place or something like that that acts on a condition such as queue depth to act against congestion or to make sure that you don't have congestion, well, that's a different thing. That is where we've got a trigger of some kind for that particular technique to be implemented. So a lot of times we talk about what we do when things are coming into a box and when things are going out of the box. Typically at the egress, we don't have as many steps. And the reason for that is you don't want something to go through an entire set of boxes or processing and then decide that you're not going to carry it forth. Now what you typically try to do, and this is true of access lists or anything, what you do is a lot of management on the goes into side, the ingress side, and then at the egress you actually have less to do. So still the same ideas, right? We're going to label in some way. We're going to have some kind of bandwidth monitor and then we're going to decide what to do with it. We're going to send it into the queues and then we're going to service the queues. On the outside, really, we just have the queues because the labels have already existed. We're not going to do queues as part of this lecture, but here's a little bit, just a little bit on queues. Really, uh, you can think of it as a queue as memory space. And so when packets are moved into the queue or moved into memory, we're preparing to move them into, say, switch fabric or into a router, or we're, we're moving it out the other side. And so normally, you, when you have queuing policies or something like this, you just have this processing and everything is fine. But a lot of times we allow traffic to burst up to a certain level before we discard it. And once we discard it, once it gets flagged, then we start throwing things out. And that's where we can have packet loss and times of congestion and things like that. Probably the most popular queuing algorithm that's out there is FIFO, or first in, first out. It is the default queuing strategy that we have, although certainly nothing says that you have to stay with this particular algorithm. There are a lot of algorithms that take a different approach to handling or servicing the queues. For example, you might do tail drop, you might be dropping random TCP packets to, uh, to cause some TCP senders to back off and that way you stay away from congestion. So there's a lot of different algorithms that you can use to service your queues. Now here's an example output. It's just a show int on one of the, the interfaces and you can see that in this, this particular case, the queuing strategy is FIFO and then the values there that are in the red box show us the activity in the queue. All right, so how does our QOS thing work? When switches and routers have traffic that they're processing, that traffic is typically not labeled. Nothing is happening, and we'll see what that looks like here in a little bit. But when we want to prioritize things, when things come from layer two, a lot of times we can specify something called a class of service. And then we can map that to a layer three type of service or differentiated services code point. Once we have the labels, then we can have a policy that says, this is how I want these particular packets with these particular labels to be treated or to be handled. And so the class can be either manually assigned, it can be assigned because you came from a particular port or a particular device can request a particular class of service. Class of service or type of service or differentiated services policy values are what we call per hop behaviors. That is to say, every single switch or every single router handles it individually. They don't talk to the other routers. If you want an end-to-end -end solution, then what you do is you apply the same policy across a bunch of routers. But the key idea here is that we're going to take something at layer two, map it up to something at layer three, typically, and then act on that mapping and label. We've said a lot of stuff here. Let's actually take a look at some numbers and, and see where we can assign them. So class of service is first. Like we said earlier, it's per hop or single link. And this is typically going to happen on a switch. So on a switch port or a particular kind of device or VLAN, you're going to set a value for the class of service. And the value range from 0 to 7. We do it with 3 bits. And then what we do is we usually map that up to a layer 3 value. We'll see how that works here in a second. Now, 
it's very common that you have a certain amount of capacity and the the priority handling has got to be inside that particular capacity and so the magic number for a lot of targeted apps is 30 percent 30 percent of link bandwidth now the key standards for us to worry about right now we're going to start with 802.1q and then we'll start talking about type of service later on we'll talk about differentiated services and what we're going to try and do before we get out of this video is try to figure out how to map those together now there's some default values down there at the bottom for voice data and signaling a value of uh, five would be for the actual data high priority and then the signaling would be a lower priority but still not zero and here's our friend the 802.1q tagged frame now we're used to looking at the vlan id which is that 101 here but here we can see those other priority bits and now that's what we're going to start worrying about this is where our class of service will actually manifest itself. Remember that VLANs and trunks are a layer two sort of thing. And so at the layer two devices is where we're going to start filling in those values for priority. And what we're going to do is say, see how these three bits can be mapped to another set of bits up at layer three. Again, it's per link or per hop behavior. So every switch would have to be told how to do this. And then there's some ratios there for voice and traffic. And then we see that 30% value popping in there. So our next step is to move up to layer three. Now, if you remember from RFC 791, our internet protocol RFC, we've got these type of service bits or the type of service field there in the header. It's eight bits. And this is what we're going to try and manipulate. Now, early on in the standard, the authors recognized that certain traffic might have to be prioritized over say standard traffic or traffic that was not consequential so we've got this 8-bit fields here and the 8-bit fields are broken up into two sort of sections one is the precedence area and then you can see all of the values for the precedence if you have all zeros in the precedence field, it's considered routine. And then we've got increasing levels of precedence on up to uh, seven, which is network control. The DTR bits for the delay, throughput, and reliability, those are values that we set that we either turn those on or turn those off. We'll see those here in a second. And bits six and seven, or the seventh and eighth bit of this field, these are uh, must be zero fields. So here's a little more detail on the categories that bit number four or the the by count if we're starting to count at zero it's bit number three is the delay prompt delivery right if it's set to zero it's just normal if we set it to one it's low delay throughput if it's zero normal throughput if it's set to one we want high throughput and the same thing with reliability with zero being normal and one being high reliability traffic and so that's what you would set those those other bits for in the traffic um, header now just a note i like to throw this in here every now and again there is a difference sometimes in how we read bits right if you take a byte of information and you've got your most significant bit over here and the least significant bit here that means something but if you flop them well then of course you get a completely different value now the related idea is big endian and little endian i'm not going to read this to you but a lot of times the order of the bytes or order of the bits is not always transmitted in the way that we think and in this case we can see the ordering is sometimes flopped now rfc 791 was the internet protocol right and RFC 1349 came along and uh, amended a lot of the RFCs that came before and added one more value. So recall at the end of the type of service field, there were two bits there. They were both must be zero. This takes one of those and says we're going to convert that to a monetary cost. So zero or one being the same setting there. And we can see our combinations here. So with the precedence on the on the left of the screen, and then we've got the varying values for type of service, and all the way at the bottom here you say that we've got minimized monetary. Okay, so we did all this work, and it turns out that folks just didn't use type of service very often. So all of this stuff that we've been talking about was actually obsoleted by RFC 
2474 differentiated services. And that's why it's our next topic after we finish this. And here we have two images. The lower one is an 802.1Q encapsulated frame. And now the priority bits are set to seven. And up above that, there's a layer three IP header. And we see that there's actually a value now in the differentiated services uh, field. Now this is actually called a diff serve code point. And we now see why Wireshark always reports this as a differentiated service field and never as a type of service field because type of service is deprecated. Now here's an example of how we map those layer two values on up to layer three. If you do a show MLS cross maps, you can see how your device is going to turn a layer two value into a layer three value or vice versa, depending on what you're trying to do. Most of the examples that we'll do here will use the mapping that you see in the red box. It's a cost to DSCP map. So we can see that, for example, a cost value set at one would be eight and the seven would be 56. Well, that's it. Thanks for watching. This has been a look at the basic cost model based on differentiated services. And we got a look at an 802.1Q header with some actual priority bit setting and an IP type of service field or differentiated services field with values set in there. Hey, like and subscribe if uh, you dug the video. Until next time, may your packets always reach their destinations.